You're listening to a Mango Languages podcast. Language teaching is hard, but there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. That's why we created this show, Teaching Languages Today, a podcast for world language educators about what's working and what's not. Listen in for the problems fellow teachers are facing, learn what solutions they found, and get some much needed self-care reminders of why you fell in love with teaching in the first place. Hi, I'm Emily, your host for the show. In each episode, I'll be taking you on a journey into seeing world language ed through a new lens by sitting down with an all-star lineup of teachers, administrators, parents, and students. It's my hope that the stories you hear in this show will get you thinking and feeling different about what you do in the classroom. Hello friends, Emily here. I am quite pumped to be sharing today's episode with you. I got to sit down with a really special guest. He's a high school teacher based in St. Louis, Missouri. He was Central State's 2020 Teacher of the Year and a finalist for Actful's 2021 National Language Teacher of the Year Award. Who was it? If you guessed Eric Richards, you would be right. Eric is a published author and experienced speaker and department chair and high school German language educator at Fort Zumwalt North High School. Our conversation was really refreshing. We covered a lot of different topics, but they all really came back to one single thread, which was how we grow as teachers. For example, we talked about how our connections with our students evolve across our careers, especially as we ourselves age. We also talked about some simple ways that every teacher can address burnout when it bubbles up for them. And we also talked about how to get our error adverse learners to actually speak up in class. So if any of that resonates with you, then stay tuned, my friends, for this episode of Teaching Languages Today. Let's listen in to my conversation with Eric Richards. Well, thank you so much. We're so excited, Eric, to have you on the show. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know that you didn't set out to be a language teacher, and then here you are getting all these kinds of awards. So how did you get here? Uh, thanks, Emily. I appreciate you having me here today. I was really excited that you guys reached out. Uh, like you said, my name is Eric Richards, and it's true. I didn't actually go to school to become a teacher. It wasn't on the radar, and it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, I teach all levels of German, one through four. I think I've been teaching now for, for 17 years. People always ask, why German? You know, I get that a lot. Why German? Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to tell anybody I'm a German teacher because here come the questions, <laughs> you know, but uh, my, my heritage is German grandparents on both sides were German. Uh, they, they, when they're here, they didn't, they didn't pass the language long, long to my parents. It's just something they didn't do back there. In fact, they anglicized our last name. So in high school, it was like, hey, you got to take a language. All right, I'll take German. You know, you heard grandma and grandpa kind of get after you every once in a while in German. And, you know, and then when I went to college, I wanted to do international business. And so I was like, hey, I want to stay with German, great business language, tons of opportunity. Uh, so I decided I'd study abroad. And I ended up going to Austria and a long story short. So for about three years, I did some undergraduate work at the University of Salzburg and some graduate work. And then I worked in Germany for a little bit until all my visas ran out and I moved back. The goal was to train in St. Louis, then move over to their uh, Germany offices. Didn't pan out. Then I got a that call one day that said, hey, are you thinking about teaching? That happened to be the right day because I was about to start interviewing for other jobs. So I thought I'd go for interview practice. Long story short, I got the job which was, like I said, I didn't even have an education class. But, uh, and, then, and then here I've been 17, year later and 17 years later, and, and that's where I've been. It's so wild, right, how one little call can change the course of your future. Oh, man, amazing. I would, I, I, it wasn't even a thought. And then that call came in, and I've been places I never thought I'd be. I'm doing things I never thought I would be doing. And it really is because of world language. I promise you that. Okay, so... Learning a language opened a lot of doors for Eric, and I'm sure that's the same in your case because if you're a language teacher or a language learner, you're probably here listening to this because you've had similar experiences. But let's go back to the beginning. In order to get the benefits from learning a language, you need to be able to speak the language. So I asked Eric how he gets his students talking in class. Here's what he said. We, we really spend a lot of time trying to get to know each other. And I think when you really try to first, I think you got to set a comfortable class atmosphere. 
you know, if, if they're clammed up, you're not getting anything out of them, but they have to, A, feel comfortable enough to want to talk with you. They have to almost kind of coach kids or untrain them, say, it's okay to make quote unquote mistakes. It, I just, just try, get it out there. It's okay. And I always tell them, I, this, this, is, this is the Eric Richards thing and I have it on my board. Expression, not perfection, especially for like my, my German one. Expression, not perfection. We're, we're speaking from day one. Uh, we're speaking in German from day one. We're speaking all the way through. We're getting them comfortable. Hey, when you're in this class, this is what we do. We speak. So uh, some of them are more resistant and you just kind of, sometimes I work with them and in uh, certain capacity, but a lot of times it's like, are they whole class activities? Call and respond. Are they uh, more, what do you say? Um, I guess one-on-one activities, maybe even like, I guess you could say like little interviews, like, you know, garnishing information from partners, working as a class. Uh, we just do a lot of different activities, like, you know, the hot seat where we put them in there and the class gets to ask them questions in the target language. They get to respond. Obviously, they're supported. There's a whole way to go through that. Uh, just really to create that atmosphere of students. When we're here, this is what we do. And it's okay. That makes me want to take your class. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Dad. I always say everyone wants to take German. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh my but no, we have a great program at our school. Uh, it's been a really, it, the last, over the years, been great. It actually expanded. We had to hire another German teacher. When's the last time that happened, you know? So we got a really, really great uh, program. Our other teachers have been great. So I have nothing but good things to say. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work, you know? So, I mean, uh, as teachers, there's heartache involved. <laughs> there's plenty of hard days. You can ask some of my colleagues. They'll be like, uh, I'll be like, what am I doing? I'm so happy that Eric brought this up because it gets us to a really important topic, teacher burnout. Why does it happen? And what do we do when it bubbles up within us? We both have some tips that we've used, which you're going to hear right now. My favorite piece of advice from one of my high school teachers before I knew I was going to go on to be an educator was that he said, some, some days you really feel like you're not having an impact and that you haven't had an impact, like a positive impact in a while. And you feel like you lose your mojo. And he told me that he has a, a physical folder where he stores like little notes from students that like make him smile. And then he goes back and actually looks at those. And I, and I do the same thing now. Do you right. have anything that you do to like keep you motivated on the bad days? I, just a really a variety of things, uh, whether even it's been like, hey, I need to concentrate a little bit more on, on me. Like say, hey, let's just, I'm gonna go home. It's a nice day, I'm going on a walk. I'm just gonna clear my head, we have bad days. But the, the things that sometimes I think about are, I don't know, sometimes like, I don't, you have a class and you're like, does anyone even care? Do they, and then all of a sudden they just come out with all this stuff and you're like, oh my gosh, you guys have to listen. This is like, it, you're just floored. I always say, I guess I understand. I'll never really understand. Cause you know, you'll think like, oh, no one's getting it. And then all of a sudden, like a couple of days later, they're like, oh, and then they'll just throw out a phrase at you. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's like, cause sometimes when you think like, eh, you know, maybe they're not really engaged or they're just, it's not, they'll just come back and they'll surprise you. It's it's really weird. And so you kind of try to hold on to those moments, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think too, is as we all go through the dark times, is, is you find your friends, you find your mentors, your other educators that you know, you can just, you know, I, I mean, I have uh, a couple that, you know, sometimes they like, hey, Eric, we're going to give you a pep talk, man, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you just find the people to support you. But again, it's, it is, it's the small things. I do have some folders, you know, you go back and look and then you kind of just think about some of the things you accomplished and how sometimes, although it may not be there immediately or on that day or the next couple of days, it's, it's probably sinking in and then they'll just surprise you, you know, or a kid will just say something to you like, man, I love this class here. You're the, you're like my favorite teacher. And you're like, I, I would have never guessed that in a million years. You know what I'm saying? You just like, you, you never would have, but uh, so you just kind of hold on to those little things. And I think too, I don't want to say selfishly, but sometimes I think as teachers to say, especially in language, like go in and have fun, teach the way you have fun. And I think that helps you through some of the hard times because if I'm having fun in class, I, they, they feel it. And I know there's a lot out there that mm. people say, oh, this is the only way to teach or this is the only method. This is the, eh. Like, eh. No, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I 100% agree with that. But if, if you're having fun where, when I say, not every day, you know what I'm saying, but if you enjoy doing what you're doing, how you're doing it, I think it resonates a little bit more with students and they see it. And I think that that comes from in our field is the collaboration you can have. That's one of the favorite things to do is collaborate, I, is, is collaborate within the field, but even like um, outside the field, like I'm currently collaborating with, uh, with a STEM teacher on just some ideas, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Pat Brown. He's, he's, a, he's a major ed- educator and, and he's in our district and he does STEM and he's just an incredibly smart man. I've learned so much from him. 
but it's like you get to th- see things that aren't even you wouldn't even think are related but actually there's there, we're finding overlap here and it's just been a lot of fun so i think that's kind of the the thing that helps too when when you're burnt out is is keeping it fresh keeping it new uh finding the new things uh, where you can and that creativity and using your creativity i think because sometimes if we just go in and and we're just bound too strictly by a curriculum or we just, we do the same thing day in and day out. It's going to get stale. I don't, and I, I don't really argue. I don't care who you are, but it's like, it's going to get stale. So that's, that's other things I try to hold on to is when I'm feeling down, it's like, Hey, I, I want to be creative here and I want to try something new with my students. That's the best part because generally if it falls flat, they don't know that <laughs> what it was supposed to look like, what you had your head. So you're like, Oh, true, true. you know, it's like, I'll try this. Hey, that was a good day. Other days, yeah, I don't do that anymore. But it's like I think that helps keep it fresh. So, on that note, how how have you grown as a teacher? What what are the biggest changes you think you've seen in yourself? Uh, uh, the the okay. Well, when I started, obviously, first couple of years, you're just trying to stay afloat. But and I started I, I started teaching class the way I was taught German in high school because that's what I knew, right? And and believe when I first started teaching, man, I loved it. I had so much fun. I was uh, back then, what you know, mid twenties, maybe. You know, I was coaching soccer. Uh, the te- I was having a great time, and it was just so much fun. And it, it was so much because, like I said, I never thought about it. I'm like, this is really fun. And then about a few years, five years, handful of years into it, I don't know. I was like, I was just kind of doing what I knew, but it had kind of got a little bit old. And then I was also wasn't seeing the results of my students that I wanted to see. And then it was kind of like. If, if I'm going to be like super honest, it was about five, five, six years in. I was like, all right, well, this was fun. I'm going to go ahead and get out of education. I mean, that really was my thought. I was going to get out of education, go back into business. But I had this thought that if I am going to leave education, I said, I'm going to just make sure that I can do everything I can. So when I walk away that I know I made the right decision just so I could sleep at night, <laughs> you know. And so I really went on this, this course of saying, all right, I started going to different professional developments. And this is like when like things like TPRS and was starting to come out a little bit, these different ideas, even when our district stopped playing for professional development, I still went, I just paid out of pocket. I mean, they were kind enough to pay for the sub, but I just, so I started just kind of tra- uh, going over uh, these different professional developments, collaborating with people, talking to people, picking people's brains. Because again, I was coming from nothing. I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing, you know? Uh, and maybe that was an asset in some ways, but um and so I started trying all this different stuff in class. And then I was like, oh, I'm seeing better results. I'm learning to stay in the target language. Uh, longer in the class, we're having uh, activities where st- uh, student engagement is high. Uh, and yeah, and I just started getting the results I wanted to see. So this idea of adding to your teaching toolkit is growth. That's us growing in our professions. But there's another kind of growth. And this has everything to do with how we connect with our students as we ourselves age. I know I myself have had um, almost like an identity crisis, and you will hear that identity crisis play out (laughs) in our conversation here in just a moment. But I hope if you have been feeling um, any certain way about the way your, your connection with your students changes as you age and the gap between you and your students Uh, increases, that this will provide you with a a new way of framing your approach to those connections and the changes that are inevitable as you grow as a teacher and age as a person. Here's something that I'm really interested in, um, because I know I I noticed this change in myself as a teacher over the years. So like when I started, I was like, I looked younger than some of the students. I was, you know, I was like 21 and they were 18 and I looked like a child and they were like, are you taking the class? And I'm like, I'm teaching it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so true. I know exactly what you're talking about. So. And like, sometimes you, you that can be seen as a disadvantage, but then it's in a lot of ways an advantage. Cause you're like, I know exactly how you guys are thinking and we're kind of like in this together and you feel in the know, right? Right. And over the years, as I got older and the, the difference in age between me and my students was different and our upbringings were different, I was like, it is getting harder to connect with these students because like, you know, if you're not on TikTok and that's where they spend most of their day outside of school, like how do you, do you feel the need to connect on that level or like keep up in that way or, or, or okay. do you not do that? No, no, I, I understand exactly what you're saying because uh, I went through the same thing. I remember when I first started teaching, uh, when it, uh, they asked me for my hall pass one time, and I was like, 
what? I teach here. You know, when I was new, I'm like, I don't need my hall pass. Do I need a hall? I'm like, I need a hall pass. And it was this weird conversation. They're like, yeah, if you're going to be in the hall, they're like, what teacher did you come from? I'm like, well, I am the teacher. They're like, oh, I was like, so I don't need a hall pass. It was just, just like, we were not like, was like, we, we kind of laughed about it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I'll never forget that. But, uh, you know, as far as obviously, yes, everything's changed. The technology's changed. The phones, the apps are always changing. Do I feel... I need, do I need to get on TikTok to connect with my students? No, <laughs> I don't personally feel that way. But what I do is I try to at least stay abreast in knowing what's out there and what's going on and about it. It's like sometimes I check the music charts because they'll, they'll say names. I'm like, oh, I should probably know that celebrity by now, you know. But you know what we also do is sometimes I just embrace being the old guy now. I'm like, I'm just the old guy. And we kind of have fun with it. We joke on it. They kind of, you know, they'll needle me. They're like, oh, yeah, I bet you. Did they even have electricity back when you were growing up? I'm like, no, man. We had like stone tablets and I was chiseling away my notes. It was crazy, you know? So we kind of have a little bit of fun with it, you know? So I kind of just embraced, you know, who I am, where I'm at in life. And I think the kids like to have fun with it. But I do take the time to try to keep up with where are they at? What are they on? Who are the celebrities they, they're, they're following in the TikTok stars and this and that? I just, at least I want to have conceptual knowledge of what they're doing, where they're at, know the names. And I think that's kind of just part of the job to know where are they at so I can connect with them in that way. But no, do I do I need an Instagram account? I, I would say probably not, but I just kind of embrace where I'm at and have fun. And I think the kids kind of appreciate that because I mean, anymore is I like getting gray in my beard. Like, ah, who am I fooling anymore? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not fooling anybody. So, uh, but yeah, good and bad. I think every teacher will go through if they're in the profession long enough. They, like you said, they go, they look just super young and you're connecting and it, it's, it, it is different because you do have that little bit of connection. I think they're quicker to connect with you. And sometimes now it takes a little bit longer to, you know, warm up to this guy in the classroom, you know, like you kind of, but I just try to have a little bit of fun with it. Yeah, it's not, it's like I think what it comes down to is just being authentic. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, for you, if you are not yourself in the classroom, they're going to see right through you, and they're they're just going to know you're being fake. And like, I, I, you know, I always tell teachers, man, dude, just be you. They're going to see through it, you know. So you just like you said, be authentic, have fun with yourself, embrace who you are, where you're at, and, and you know what I'm saying. So. Yeah, I think I think a lot of teachers will benefit from hearing this conversation because it's like it's almost like an identity crisis right like you you experience that shift in yourself but then also you're like well the way i'm relating to my students now is changing and like it should like mm -hmm. how how would it not you know as as you change and as as they're changing so yeah okay who's ready for an abrupt shift in topic i could have come up with a really awesome transition here, guys, but um, I just I just didn't. Because I wanted to ask Eric about what I feel like is the elephant in the room, the teacher shortage. Eric has some helpful ways of understanding what exactly is going on here. I do understand why teachers are leaving the field. I get it. It, it, can, it can be exhausting. We all have those thoughts. We need to articulate our thoughts and say it's okay to have these thoughts. Because I think sometimes it's like, if we're like, oh my gosh, I want to quit, like we take it really hard because sometimes teachers feel this is a calling versus just a job. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when we talk about education, we don't balance the equation. And what I mean about that is maybe we're quick to talk about teachers or I don't want to say blame teachers, but, you know, talk about teachers or maybe administrators or the system. But there's a lot, so many more aspects. So there's the human aspect of teachers that we need to be able to talk about and articulate. I think it's too, it's like there's the role of the students and the, and, and the value of what we're doing and, and knowing uh, what, I guess their role is as students to help this whole process be a positive process is the parents uh, also and again they don't have to do bad things it's just to say that hey we all have a role and there's so many different aspects that that are part of this that if we all kind of do our part a little bit I think we can probably move forward all right and I think if we just allow teachers to be human and I think teachers need to also just realize their role too and just kind of sometimes take a deep breath I, th I think we're going to be okay, but I think it's going to take a lot of conversations and really looking at that equation across the board and not just saying teachers, teachers, or administrators, or the system, or the school, like we have to set boundaries. We have to bring back a little bit more personal responsibility on all levels instead of saying, oh, well, got to be positive about it. I think we just got to be real about it and say, actually, that's, that's pretty normal that every teacher's going to have some down days. You're going to even have a down year. I mean, I can remember distinctly how to just just sometimes we have a rough year. It just it just didn't go, you know, and for whatever it could be inside, outside of the system, it doesn't know. But but those are real things. And to say that's okay, you know, it's not this 
Java, this is root, root, rah, rah, 24, 7, 365 every year because it, it's not realistic and it's not sustainable, you know? But right. again, if everyone just takes a look at the whole equation, let's try to balance the equation, I, I think we, there'll be a little bit of hope. All right, friends, we have reached the part of the conversation where we get to talk about the target language that our guest speaks, which in this case is German. Let's go. What is, in your opinion, in your experience, the hardest part of learning German as an English speaker? And then like, what's the, the coolest thing in your opinion about the German language? Okay, uh, the hardest part about German for me, oh, and I think a lot of people that learn German will say this, it's gotta be one of two things. It's either the Der D and Das, the articles, the definite articles, and the multiple changes they go through in the case system. Like for an English speaker, we're like the, <laughs> you know, for the Germans, it's like, <laughs> Uh, how many different ways can you say that and why, <laughs> you know, but uh, so that could be a little bit maddening for an English speaker. It, but the coolest part is, is that like German, it just, it makes so much sense. You know, the Germans are always, you know, you always hear long German words, but it's like, yeah, sometimes I take a word here, there, put it together. And you're like, that's exactly what it is. And kids will always say, so if I put this word, this word, is that a German word? I'm like, it actually is. They're like, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> you know, like, just give it a shot. And if it's not, they're going to understand you. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just piece it together. Um, yeah. Cause I, you know, we always hear at least in the U S that like, Oh, the German language, it doesn't sound romantic. It sounds really like harsh. Did you ever think that before? And now that you, you are a speaker of it, has your opinion changed if at all? My perception of it has, has absolutely changed. In fact, like I think in many ways, like, it's a very pretty language and you really dive into it and you get into it and you and you get these idiomatic expressions and just talk to people. You realize like this is nothing that I thought it was going to be. And I think you can and then you start appreciating more. And I was like, like I said, I think it's it's it, it's just it's fun. I don't I, I think it's in many ways. It's very pretty. And I think it's very good ways to express yourself. There's times now that I'm like, I don't know. I can only say this in German because it's just a feeling, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> of the words. I, I'm sure you understand that you're like, I, it's just not a great English word for this right now because it's yes. a feeling it's inside of you. Doesn't that just My, feel like a win? It always just feels like such a win like a bilingual win when you're like, I feel this non-English word in my body. Like this is, this is my word over like the English one. You're just kind of right. like, it's in my brain. It's in my heart now. <laughs> and, it's, and I thought it's like when I was living there, if you learned like a concept, let's, let's just say, uh, you know, maybe a ge geography as a geography class. And I learned some geography terms like in German and I didn't know them in English. So when it was like, I, I would find myself like, I don't even know what we say in English for this word. Like it was just because it was the only word I knew for this because I didn't have uh, uh, something in the L1 to, to, you know, it was, it was funny, but yeah, it's uh, my, I think like my, like sometimes my students say, uh, Mr. Richards, are, are you having a stroke? Because it's like, you know, you start code mixing and you're just like, uh, uh, like the German wants to come or they're like, they, it, it's like, uh, they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm just working out in my head, guys. I got to figure out which one's coming first. Because yeah. I remember, uh, was like, man, when I first moved there after a few months and I was really getting into it, my parents would call and I'd be like, they're like, oh, what you do? I was like, oh, yeah, I had to go buy a, a, a what, what's that thing you hold over your head in, in the rain? They're like, an umbrella? I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that's a word because I could only think of the German word for umbrella. And I'm like, what? you know, and I remember those times. Yeah. So it just starts coming. And I think it's, it's, it's fun. It's a really cool feeling, I think. So. Eric, that's the end of our show. We made it. <laughs> I'm so glad that you, you reached out. So much fun. I enjoyed being here and it's been great. Well, that was my conversation with Eric Richards, high school German language educator and department chair at Fort Zumwalt North High School in St. Louis, Missouri. It was really a pleasure to sit down with someone who has all of these awards from Central States, from Actful, to share their on-the-ground experience of being a human, being a teacher, being an educator, and chugging away each day to improve their practice as a teacher. Thank you, Eric, for sitting down with us and for being part of the Mango Languages family. And to all of our listeners, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or night. I don't know when you're listening to this podcast. Regardless... Have a good one. And if you enjoyed the episode, you can let us know by following the podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye. This episode was hosted, produced, and edited by me, Dr. Emily Sabo. Our production manager is Dr. Erica Catregli. And our audience was 
Oh, wait, that's you. <laughs> Thank you so much.